Congenital Cardiac Defects with Increased Pulmonary Blood Flow by Patricia Lincoln. My name is Trish Lincoln. I'm the Clinical Nurse Specialist in the Cardiac ICU at Children's Hospital Boston. Today's lecture will provide information on the most common congenital heart defects and their surgical repairs. In the present lecture, I will be talking about defects with increased pulmonary blood flow. Introduction. What will happen with congenital heart defects that cause an increase in pulmonary blood flow? The increase in pulmonary blood flow occurs as blood shunts left to right at either the atrial level or ventricular level through a hole in the septum and is recirculated back to the lungs. This shunting of blood causes a volume overload on the heart and the lungs. The pressures in the different chambers of the heart are seen here. The pressures on the right side of the heart are lower than the pressures on the left side of the heart. In defects which cause openings between the chambers in the heart, blood will flow between the openings from the left side of the heart to the right side. Blood will flow the path of least resistance, going from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure. Increased pulmonary blood flow causes congestive heart failure and pulmonary hypertension. However, if a surgical repair is performed, these conditions will not occur. Congestive heart failure. When the blood that should be going out of the left side of the heart returns back to the right side of the heart, a larger volume of blood than normal must be handled by the right side of the heart. The right side of the heart becomes overworked and enlarged, causing congestive heart failure. Pathophysiology. The following are common symptoms of congestive heart failure. The size of the defect will affect the types and severity of the symptoms and the age of the child when the symptoms start. The patient will tire easily during activity. The patient may be sweaty, have rapid breathing, heavy breathing, or congested breathing. There is a disinterest in feeding or the patient tires with feeds. The patient has poor growth. The patient has frequent respiratory infections. These symptoms may resemble other medical conditions or heart problems. Much more information is needed before a diagnosis is made. Pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. The child with congenital heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow is at risk for developing pulmonary hypertension, which may result in pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. The changes that occur with pulmonary vascular obstructive disease are seen after one year of increased pulmonary blood flow. Increased pulmonary blood flow leads to changes in the pulmonary blood vessels. These pathologic changes in the pulmonary vessels cause pulmonary hypertension. Over time, pulmonary hypertension causes pulmonary vascular obstructive disease. This will decrease pulmonary blood flow as blood is unable to get through the damaged pulmonary blood vessels. The treatment of pulmonary hypertension includes maintaining respiratory alkalosis for these patients with a pH greater than 7.40. Respiratory alkalosis will promote pulmonary vasodilation, which may decrease pulmonary vascular resistance. You should avoid a respiratory acidosis. Respiratory acidosis causes pulmonary vasoconstriction, which will increase pulmonary vascular resistance. The patient must be provided adequate oxygen. Oxygen is a pulmonary vasodilator. The patient needs pain control. Catecholamine release from pain will stimulate blood vessel vasoconstriction. The patient with high pressure in the pulmonary blood vessels and pulmonary hypertension should be sedated to decrease patient movements and agitation as that will increase oxygen needs. The patient may also need to be pharmacologically paralyzed to completely control ventilation and prevent any stimulation to blood vessels in the pulmonary bed. Nitric oxide as an inspired gas may be administered if available. This gas is blended into the patient's inspired oxygen and will dilate the pulmonary vascular bed. Effects associated with increased pulmonary blood flow that I will be discussing are atrial septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus, and ventricular septal defect. 
atrial septal defect. An atrial septal defect occurs when there is an opening in the atrial septum, the dividing wall between the two upper chambers of the heart, known as the right atria and the left atria. An atrial septal defect allows oxygen-rich red blood to pass from the left atrium through the opening in the septum and mix with the oxygen-poor blue blood in the right atrium. The blood flows from the left side of the heart through the abnormal opening in the septum to the right side of the heart because the pressure on the left side of the heart is higher than the pressure on the right side of the heart. Atrial septal defects occur during fetal development when the separating process that forms the septum is not completed. Atrial septal defects occur in 5 to 10 percent of all children born with congenital heart di disease. There is a female predominance for this defect. There are three types of atrial septal defects. The first type is an osteum primum atrial septal defect. This is an abnormal opening low in the atrial septum. The child with an osteum primum atrial septal defect usually also has a cleft or abnormally formed mitral valve. The second type is an osteum secundum atrial septal defect. This is an abnormal opening in the center of the atrial septum. This atrial septal defect is the most common type. The third type is a sinus venosus atrial septal defect. This is an abnormal opening high in the atrial septum, usually near the superior vena cava at the right atrial junction. The clinical signs of atrial septal defect are a murmur that is auscultated at the second intercostal space. This split second heart sound occurs with the delay in closure of the pulmonary valve because of the volume overload on the right side of the heart. It is fixed because the split does not vary with respiration. If oxygen saturations in the heart are measured, the oxygen saturation in the right atrium is higher than the oxygen saturation in the superior vena cava or inferior vena cava. And on chest radiograph, the heart will appear enlarged and lung changes will be seen. Surgical repair of a primum atrial septal defect is the closure of the opening between the right and left atria with a piece of Dacron. The mitral valve is repaired with a different piece of Dacron or sutures to the cleft in the leaflets. The main postoperative concern after repair of a primum atrial septal defect is blood pressure control, so there is no extra pressure on the newly repaired mitral valve. Also, electrocardiogram changes may occur due to sutures from the patch placement in the atria. Surgical repair of secundum atrial septal defect is closing the opening between the right and left atria using a piece of Dacron or a piece of pericardium, which is the membranous sac covering the heart. If the opening in the atria is very small, it may be sutured closed. The main postoperative concern after repair of a secundum atrial septal defect is electrocardiogram changes due to sutures in the atria that may disrupt the conduction pathway of the heart. Here the pathway of the heart's conduction system is shown in yellow. Sutures securing the closure of the hole in the atrial septum may interfere with the conduction of the heartbeat, causing a problem with the heart rhythm. The most common arrhythmia experienced after atrial septal defect repair are atrial flutter or third degree heart block or complete heart block. In atrial flutter, the atrial rate is very fast, about 300 beats per minute. The P wave has a sawtooth configuration on electrocardiogram. The ventricular rate varies. The QRS looks normal. Third degree heart block is also known as complete heart block. In third degree heart block, the atria are contracting, the ventricles are contracting. However, there is no communication between the atrial and ventricular contractions. Patent ductus arteriosus. A patent ductus arteriosus is a vascular communication between the pulmonary artery and the aorta that persists after birth. The ductus arteriosus normally closes between birth and the first two weeks of life as the vessel fills with fibrin. Delayed closure is common in premature infants. 
Patent ductus soteriosis accounts for about 12% of congenital heart disease and is more common in females. Clinical signs of patent ductus arteriosus are a murmur auscultated at the second to third intercostal space, a wide pulse pressure due to the continued blood flow across the ductus from the aorta during diastole. This is called aortic runoff. There may also be an increase in systolic blood pressure. Surgical management of patent ductus arteriosus is by ligation of the vessel either by clip or cut or tie via a thoracotomy incision. Ventricular septal defect. A ventricular septal defect occurs when there is an opening in the ventricular septum, the wall dividing the two bottom chambers of the heart, known as the right and left ventricles. A ventricular septal defect allows oxygen-rich red blood to pass from the left ventricle through the septum and mix with the oxygen-poor blue blood in the right ventricle. The blood flows from the left side of the heart through the abnormal opening to the right side of the heart because the pressure on the left side of the heart is higher than the pressure on the right side of the heart. A ventricular septal defect occurs during fetal development when the separating process that forms the septum is not completed. A ventricular septal defect is the most common type of congenital heart disease. Ventricular septal defect occurs in about 25% of all congenital heart disease. There are four types of ventricular septal defects. The first type, a muscular ventricular septal defect, occurs low in the ventricular septum between the trabeculae or muscle strings that are found in the ventricle. These defects are usually small and may close on their own. If a patient has a number of muscular ventricular septal defects, the patient may have one or two still open even after surgery. A second type of ventricular septal defect is a subpulmonic ventricular septal defect. That is an opening in the ventricular septum that occurs under the pulmonary valve. A third type of ventricular septal defect is a membranous ventricular septal defect. These occur in the outflow tract of the left ventricle below the aortic valve. This type accounts for about 80% of all ventricular septal defects. A fourth type is a perimembranous ventricular septal defect. A perimembranous ventricular septal defect is an opening in the upper section of the ventricular septum near the valves. Two major clinical signs of a ventricular septal defect are a murmur, which is heard best over the left lower sternal border, radiating to the right lower sternal border. Also, the patient may be failure to thrive. A small defect will cause a large amount of resistance to blood flow and result in a loud murmur. A large defect will not cause as much resistance, so the murmur will be quieter. The surgical repair of a ventricular septal defect is usually done through an incision made in the atrial wall with the defect approached through the atrium ventricular valves. Depending on the size of the ventricular septal defect, it is either closed with a stitch if it is small or a patch made of dacron or pericardium if it is larger. The surgical approach for the repair is through the atrium, so the muscle of the ventricle is not cut and the contractility of the ventricular muscle is not affected. Postoperative concerns after repair of ventricular septal defect are electrocardiogram changes caused by edema from the surgical site or sutures going through the conduction pathways. There is always a possibility of a residual ventricular septal defect being present. In a patient with multiple ventricular septal defect, the patch or sutures may not close all of the defects. Or if the ventricular septal defect was very large, the patch may not cover all of it and they may be a residual defect. Or the patch may be loose and not completely close the opening. A large portion of the conduction pathway for the ventricles goes directly through the ventricular septum where the ventricular septal defect patch or sutures are placed during surgery. The conduction of the heart may be interrupted by the sutures or by swelling from around the sutures. 
The most common arrhythmias experienced after repair of ventricular septal defect are third degree heart block and junctional rhythm. Third degree heart block is also known as complete heart block. In third degree heart block, the atria are contracting, the ventricles are contracting. However, there is no communication between the atrial and ventricular contractions. The sinoatrial node is located in the upper part of the right atrium and the atrioventricular node is located in the top part of the ventricles. In junctional rhythm, the conduction of the heart originates from around the AV junction and not the SA node where conduction normally begins. In junctional rhythm, the heart only responds to some of the conduction impulses. To check for a residual ventricular septal defect, blood samples are taken from lines placed in the right atrium and the pulmonary artery. The saturations of both blood samples should be the same or about 75 to 80 percent as this blood has not gone through the lungs and been oxygenated. If the sample in the pulmonary artery has an oxygen saturation of 90 percent or higher, there is mixing of oxygenated blood returning to the left side of the heart from the lungs through a residual ventricular septal defect. These are the intracardiac lines placed in the heart during surgery. The right atrial line is placed directly into the right atrium. The left atrial line is threaded through the right upper pulmonary vein into the left atrium. The pulmonary artery line is threaded through the right ventricle up until the pulmonary artery. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.